Hi leaders, well it's great to be together for our first ever Global Leaders Day and uh, just I want to say hi to every one of you whether you're uh, in Asia, in Nepal, Hong Kong or in Africa there in uh, Uganda or Ghana or Nigeria or down in Namibia um, or, or over in Europe with Chris and Sarah and the team there in Poland, hi guys uh, and also around Scotland, way up in Port Soy, the folks up in the Highlands there up in Aberdeenshire and also over in Glasgow and Love Church and hey to the folks in Edinburgh and anyone else who's joining us, thanks so much for being together. And it's a significant moment. We, we're leaders, it's our first ever global, Go Global Leaders Day and uh, I feel very privileged to be sharing with you in this moment. Our theme for the day is healthy leaders, healthy churches. And uh, for Go Global, our goal isn't that we'll have the biggest and the best churches. Uh, hey, I think you will become big churches. I think you will become great churches. But above and beyond that, our goal is that we're healthy, God-glorifying churches. Truly healthy. And that's our desire. And so what would that look like? Well, that's what I want to look at in this session. What does it look like to be a healthy leader? Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. Uh, Father, thank you for everyone joining. You know their lives. You, thank you for these leaders who give so much for your people. And I pray in this time, Lord, that you will encourage and equip and build up leaders. I pray that for those leaders who are feeling discouraged, that this would be a time of encouragement. For all of us, it would be a time of refocusing. And I pray, God, we would have a legacy of being healthy leaders and raising healthy churches for the glory and honour of God in our generation. Amen. So what makes a healthy leader? Well, let me ask you a question. First of all, what makes a healthy person? To be a healthy person, it's kind of obvious. You need to have a good diet, eat healthy food, and you need to have exercise. You need both diet and exercise. So let's now apply that to healthy leaders or healthy believers. Um, as healthy followers of Jesus, we need a good diet and we need exercise. Well, the good diet, Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we need to have the good diet of taking in the nourishment of God's word. And, and hey, none of us needs to tell us the importance of daily reading the word of God and letting it feed our souls. But we also need exercise and this is the bit I want to focus on so it's not just the word of God we need that's our food we need the works of God that's our exercise let me take you to this moment where Jesus describes how he was nourished and built up by the works of God this is John chapter 4 he's just finished interacting with the woman at the well in Samaria and he says in verse 27 onwards just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman but no one asked what do you want or uh, why are you talking with her? And then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Uh, meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus was saying that there's something so deeply satisfying, like a good meal. There's something so deeply satisfying when you know you've done the will of God. When you're in the bullseye, of God's will for your life. When you're doing the things you were born or born again to do. So let me now apply this to leadership. Leadership, I mean, we can be very busy. Business, uh, leaders can be very busy. To be honest, leadership can be a draining experience. Leadership can be exhausting or tiring. Uh, you know, we're you know, meeting people who are struggling, people who are discouraged, maybe people who are disgruntled. You're spending your time organizing things or hosting things, texting people, emailing people, in meetings, in events, doing rotas. Man, it's just 
like the busyness of leadership. And uh, I mean, so someone once said that church is like a helicopter. You don't want to get too close to it or you'll get sucked up into the rotors. <laughs> okay, now there's nothing fundamentally wrong with rotors or organizing or texting or meetings. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with those things. All of the above are important parts of, of church life. And however, let me say, if that's all your leadership is about, then you'll be drained and exhausted. In fact, you'll be undernourished. None of the above, none of those things, texting, emailing, organizing events, rotas, none of those things is what Jesus was describing when he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. He was, when, he, when he said, I, I found deep satisfaction like a good meal in doing the will of God, it was to do with the ministry he'd just been involved with. So let's just, let's just look back in the verses before the verses we read and let's look at what Jesus was describing. Let's look at this good meal that Jesus just had, how he found nourishment and satisfaction in, in his ministry. Let's, let's, let's read it. This is verse 4 of John 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of grounds <coughs> Jacob had given to his, son's Joseph, <coughs> to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a woman, a Samaritan woman, came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As did his sons and also his livestock. Jesus answered, anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water. And he told her, Go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you are now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Uh, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming, and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking with you, I am he. That's so powerful. Now notice, on the back of that experience, he said to his disciples, I have food that you do not know about. I feel nourished from that experience I've just had. I feel fed. And as leaders, I want you to be nourished. I want you to not be undernourished, but I want you to be healthy, nourished leaders. So I want you to have the same experience. Notice there's not one word in what Jesus describes of, it's, 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 it's not about rotas. It's not about busyness of a leader. There's one word to describe what Jesus has just gone through there. One word that can describe the thing that will cause you to be nourished more than anything else in your leadership journey. And that word is, well, it's two words. It's making disciples. Jesus made a disciple and he felt nourished from the experience. So I've got seven points for you today and these seven points are designed to help you be a healthy leader, someone who, like Jesus, can say, 
oh, I feel satisfied. I want you to be able at the end of your, your leadership day to go home at night and say, God, I feel, I feel like I've had a great meal. Spiritually, I feel satisfied because I know I was exactly doing the things you wanted me to do. And you don't always feel that when you've just been busy. But when you've done the right things, you do feel that. So let me just zone in on what does it actually mean to be a person, a leader, who's doing the right things. Not a few degrees off, but bullseye, the right things. Seven, seven things. Number one, make disciples, don't just be busy. Make disciples, don't just be busy. So what is discipleship? What does it mean to make disciples? And, you know, there are books people have written about this and there are many definitions. I mean, the word disciple means a learner or a follower. So when we're told by Jesus and the Great Commission to go and make disciples, we're told to make followers of Jesus. But hey, let me just get beyond the definitions. Let me just make it really simple. Because of an encounter with Jesus, this woman is now super excited about Jesus. She's telling her town about Jesus. She's becoming more like Jesus and she's turned from her sins. All right. So you can put whatever definition you want to that. But all I know is that she's really excited about Jesus. So because of an encounter that someone's had with you, whether it was through your preaching or whether it was you're leading a small group or you're doing a Bible study or you went to visit them in the home. But because you hung out with them, because you encountered them, they're now really excited about Jesus. They're more like Jesus. They're telling people about Jesus. That's what we're looking for. And when you've had a meeting like that and they're buzzing about Jesus, whether it would be a non-Christian who's become a Christian or whether it be a mature Christian who's just more excited about Jesus, it's like rejuvenated their faith. And you know you had a part to play in that? Wow, you sleep well at night. That's what I'm talking about. Don't just be busy, make disciples. At the end of our lives, he's not going to ask you, how busy were you as leaders? He's going to say, did you do what I called you to do? Did you make disciples? Our goal isn't busyness <clears throat> as leaders. Our goal is to make disciples. Now, we can end up being busy <laughs> making disciples. That's okay. We can handle busyness. But what we can't handle is when we're just go, 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 and there's no satisfaction. See, I don't care if we do rotas. No problem. But have we made disciples? I don't care if we've, you know, done an event. That's great. But have we made disciples? Now, some of you lead small groups and you're actually making disciples. Others of you lead small groups, but you're not making disciples. There's a, there's, you know there's a difference. You can, you can go to a small group and you, you, know, you go to this house for, for someone's doing a Bible study and you feel I've really grown in Christ. But you can go to another house where someone's doing a Bible study and you just feel, well, we kind of talked about various things, but you didn't feel changed. You could be a preacher and through your preaching, you're making disciples and you think, oh, I feel so satisfied. But you could be a preacher and actually no one's been made into disciples. You know, they were maybe impressed by what you said, but they didn't, they weren't, didn't go away excited about Jesus. There's a difference. You see, you could be busy teaching kids in, in, in a kid's uh, children's Sunday school or Bible class environment and you're making disciples. Those kids are more excited about Jesus. Some of them have got saved. Some of them are, are deepening in the faith. Some of them have decided to get baptized. Or you could be teaching kids and actually you're just, going through, you're just on a rota and you're just going through the material and you're just doing this craft, but there aren't disciples being made. See, um, or you could be organizing things. You could be organizing events. You could be organizing rotas. You could be doing administration and making disciples or you could be just involved with the organization and you're not involved with making disciples and there's no satisfaction in that. You're going to find nourishment and satisfaction in making disciples. And, and for the Go Global Churches, listen, I don't care what your church looks like. I don't care. Some of you might want to meet in big auditoriums with thousands of people like a mega church. Fantastic. If you're making disciples. Others of you do house churches like James and the, and the team there in Hong Kong and Jess. You guys have got house churches. And, uh, and that's brilliant, as long as you're making disciples. Some of you want to do cafe style church or church like this. or church. Actually, that's secondary. What's primary is, are you making disciples? What it looks like is completely secondary. So let's make disciples. Jesus was deeply satisfied. A Samaritan woman with weak morals was now excited about Jesus. She was repenting of her sin and she was now telling others. And Jesus said, wow. I feel like I've eaten so well. 
because my food is to do the will of the Father. So point number one, don't just be busy, make disciples. Point number two, every time you meet someone, have an agenda. <clears throat> Notice that in this conversation, so again, this is about how do you become one of those leaders who's a healthy leader, a satisfied leader. So this is, my, this is the next key. Number two, every meeting have an agenda. Jesus had an agenda in this conversation. It's very clear. He was steering the conversation. He had one agenda in this conversation. I remember when, uh, when we started the church in Edinburgh way back in the late 1990s, I was working originally as a full-time in an architect's office. It was a busy career and I didn't have much time. So I, but I used my lunch breaks to make disciples. So because I was planting a church, I wanted to make the most of my time. So in my lunch breaks, I would meet a different person each day and I would disciple them. And typically what would happen is we would meet at kind of half past 12. I'd have my sandwiches, they'd have their sandwiches. And for one hour, we'd go for a walk, have our sandwiches and talk. And we would go for a walk down by the river near where my office was. And then we'd walk back to the, and that was the end of my time making disciples. But, but what I would do in that, every time I would meet someone, I'd have one thing I wanted to talk to them about. Now, I would usually talk about other things like, how are you doing? How's your week going? Um, is, you know, are you feeling better now? Or how did that job interview go? You know, just the kind of stuff of life because we want to be human as well. But then I'd get to my point. There would always be one thing in my heart for them. Now, I, and that would be, the, for example, for some people it might have been, I want to talk to you about water baptism. And that would be the focus of our conversation. I wouldn't want to bombard them with five things. Just want one thing. Uh, or it might be, okay, can I, can I talk to you? Maybe meet um, Graham one day and we'd be talking about how's your Bible reading going? Or I met Bill one day, another guy I was discipling. I'd talk about how's, how's, how's your Bible study on your identity in Christ going? Or, you know, I would find one theme and we would talk about that. And so when you meet people, I encourage you, have one point that the Holy Spirit puts in your heart that you are to bring to that person. Now, how do you get that one agenda for that meeting? Well, you can either get it before the meeting. So you go into a meeting and saying, Lord, what do you want me to talk to this person about? And just ask, and he'll give you something. Or if you arrive in that meeting and you haven't got the agenda yet, in the middle of the conversation, while you're getting through the preliminaries, yeah, how are you doing? How's your week been? Under your breath, you're praying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying for this person? Just ask him for the one thing. People can't handle three things or four things or five things. Just give them one thing. Give them one thing to chew over. In every meeting, have one thing you want to talk about, an agenda. Number two, and by the way, this, this can work if it's in your small group or you're meeting one of the people who are in your small group as a one-to-one -one chat or you're doing a home visit. You just want to have, hey, I just want to talk to you today about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I just want to talk to you today about how is your integrity? You know, so just choose one thing. Number three, don't just make appointments, make divine appointments. <laughs> How do I do that? Okay, well, let me just go back to this account with Jesus. Okay, it was a total setup. L notice in the first verse we read, John 4 verse 4, it says, now he had to go through Samaria. Technically, he didn't have to go through Samaria. He could have, he could have taken the coastal route um, to the west by the Mediterranean, or he could have taken an inland eastern route across the Jordan River and up that way. So he didn't have to go through Samaria. But when it says he had to go through Samaria, it's because Jesus knew, I'm going to meet someone there. And he felt compelled. So he had to go through Samaria. And notice also it says in verse 6, John 4 verse 6, it was about noon. And that was when the woman came to get the water from the well. Now, why would she get water from the well at noon? That was the heat of the day. Typically in that uh, Middle Eastern area, people would get the water. Women would draw water first thing in the morning or at dusk, not in the heat of the day because you're carrying this big water jug. So it was a divine appointment. I, I don't know why she came at that time, but it was an anomaly. It wasn't normal. Jesus knew he needed to be there. She was there. It was a divine setup. And I want to encourage you leaders, don't just make appointments, make divine appointments. Ask God for divine appointments. When you're leading, you, you might be leading a house church or a small group or a Bible study in your flat or a, a Zoom, an online small group on Zoom, for example. Or you might be leading a whole church or maybe you're leading a team. Ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, is there anyone 
in my group or in my leadership or in my house church that you want me to contact today? And some days you might not get anything. Other days you might say, you need to phone Jean. And you don't know why, you just, you just know you need to phone her. And it, it might be as simple as a text or a phone call or you visit their house or you're in the way to a work appointment and as you're on the way there, you just, Holy Spirit, is there anyone? Is, is there something I need to be aware of? And oh, I need to visit so-and-so. So you just take a wee detour, you pop in, hey, I just knew I needed to come to your door. Can I pray for you today? And oh, wow, I can't believe you're here. This is just, a, I just, I was going through this challenge. Thank you for turning up. Let the Holy Spirit, see, the Holy Spirit wants to help you shepherd the people you're leading. And he will give you those divine appointments. So don't just make appointments, make divine appointments and ask God, okay, God, who do you want me to meet next week? And then schedule those meetings. So make appointments that are divine appointments. The Holy Spirit is the best leader. And if you follow his lead, it will actually make your time very efficient because you'll hit the bullseye every time because you'll be meeting the right people at the right times. Number four, don't just operate, sorry, operate in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, not just in your natural ability. It's interesting, Jesus said to the woman in John 4 verse 18, you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband's. You know, so this was, this was like Hollywood's Joan Collins here. <laughs> so many husbands losing count. Yeah, there was Neville and oh, he was a loser. And then there was Jim and oh man, he was, he was a crackpot, you know. And there was so many husbands. And this is a word of knowledge. And when a word of knowledge comes, when, when a word from heaven comes, it just cuts through. It wasn't just natural intuition it wasn't just natural observation it was a holy spirit inspired word it says in proverbs 25 11 like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken at a proper time there's something so special about when that word from god comes it just comes right into your soul just at the right moment let's be the leaders who do that either by accident or because the holy spirit inspired us to i had a meeting um earlier this week with our new youth pastor in the church, Phil. He's, he's just joined our staff team here in Edinburgh. And it was a lovely meeting. And, and do you know what really impressed me was uh, we had a nice catch up. And then, but, but Phil said, oh, Pete, when I was coming to the meeting, uh, God gave me this word for you. I was, I was asking God, God, is there a word for Pete? And he gave me this word for you, Pete. And he gave me a prophecy. How cool is that? Well done, Phil. I mean, that's just so cool. I just love that, that let's be those kind of leaders who take the time to ask, Lord, are you saying something? Now, I also know that some leaders are more prophetic than other leaders. I get that. But we can all ask God. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26, when you assemble, each one has. Say that with me. Each one has. When you assemble, each one has. A psalm has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. So the New Testament's expectation is when kind of church gatherings happen, that the people of God have heard from God and God's given you words. So I want to encourage us, let's be, especially as leaders, not just as church members, but as leaders, let's be those people who model that and, hey God, are you saying something for someone today? He could give you a word. He might give you a miracle for someone, a healing for someone. God, I know you've just, you've given me this, you give me faith to see a miraculous breakthrough in that person's life. Let's step out. How'd you do that? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, it says, pursue love, you earnestly desire spiritual gifts. In other words, pursue love. You love the people enough. Oh God, I really want to bless them. I want to bless Pete as I'm meeting him today. Or I want to meet, I want to bless my small group. God, would you give me something supernatural for them? Because I know how good it is when that happens to me. I want to do it for them. Give me a word for them, Lord. Give me a picture for them. God, let be, give me a tongue or an interpretation for them. Ask God for something for the people. And then... And just a challenge. When's the last time someone in your house church or your small group first for the first time was baptized in the Holy Spirit and start speaking in tongues? Come on, we need to see that happen again. Boy, oh boy, it would encourage your small group, right? When's the last time you brought a word to a fellow leader? When's the last time you prayed for someone who was sick and saw a miracle? Some of you have lost your youthful zeal. Some of you used to be into this. And you used to go for that all the time. You said, oh Lord, give me a word. Lord, let's see a miracle. Let's see someone speak in tongues. You used to be, that used to be what you did all the time. 
but for some of you, you've lost your edge, you've forgotten, and I'm just lovingly reminding you. The reason you're finding maybe your leadership journey a bit dry, maybe you're feeling a bit undernourished, is because actually your food comes from doing the will of the Father. And Jesus is describing this experience he had with this woman at the well where he moved in the supernatural. And I want you to have the deep satisfaction of saying, God, you use me. Okay, number five, don't just talk. Talk about the greatest things. You know, notice in this conversation that Jesus had with this woman at the well, he talked about the greatest things. He talked about worship, salvation, prophecy, and, um, and it was so powerful. So don't just talk about life, talk about the Bible. You know, some of you have, you've got a house church in your house or a small group and you kind of, it's really sociable, it's very nice and people feel very, and and that's important as well. You know, people feel, they don't feel lonely because they've got friends and there's, and you talk about sport and you talk about how's your week been and hey, how's that challenge going? And that's all loving and that's, that's human and it's needed, okay? But we need another layer. And the other layer is this. Don't just talk about the stuff of life. Get to the greatest things. What did God say to you this week? Oh, let me show you what God spoke to me. Let's talk from the Bible. Let's get into the text. Let's talk about the greatest things. A a great example of what you can do in your leadership journey is if if someone in your group or in someone in your church says, hey, what about this issue? Or what about the war in Ukraine? Or what about this? Then what to do as a leader is say, well, let's see, what does the Bible say? Don't just share opinions. Constantly point people to the truth. Point number six. Don't just make disciples. Make disciples who make disciples. <laughs> Again, I'm talking to you about how to be a healthy leader, how to be someone who's well-nourished. And Jesus said he was well-nourished. He was talking to his disciples and he was saying they, they, they'd arrived back from the town with food And he said to them, I have food that you don't even know about. In other words, I feel nourished spiritually because I've done the will of the Father. I've just had a great conversation. And as Jesus was saying that to his disciples, the woman who he just talked to was in the same town that the disciples had been in, telling the whole town about Jesus. And as he he was saying that to his disciples, the woman and the town were coming out to the well to meet Jesus. So Jesus wasn't just satisfied by the conversation he'd had. He was satisfied by the conversations that she was now having. Because he knew she's in the town pointing people to Jesus. And she's now being a catalyst for people to get excited about Jesus and be more close to Jesus and be transformed by Jesus. I love that. So I don't want you just to make disciples leaders. Um, I want us to make disciples who in turn make disciples. And I guarantee you will have deepest, deepest satisfaction from doing that. Um, As some of you know, the story of our church was that we started the church and in our living room and the first church member we had was my good friend, Bill Prentice. And I joke because Bill in those early, Bill I think might even be on this uh, leadership hub today, sorry, in this Go Global Leaders Day. Bill, when I first met him, had long hair. He's a South African guy, long hair and a beard. And I joke that, oh, he looked just like Jesus. And I say, well, if you're going to start a church, if you can get a guy who looks just like Jesus, it's a great start. So he was our first church member. And he, to be honest, was my first disciple. And, I, and I, we met together on a re- most weeks we would meet and we would talk about the Bible. Sometimes we'd go out and witness. Sometimes we'd go pray together. We were just, we did discipleship together. But you know what gave me the deepest satisfaction was my first church member, Bill, became my first church planter. Bill and his precious wife, Izzy, moved to Inverness courageously with a group of others from Edinburgh to plant our first ever church. So a disciple was now making disciples. And Bill and Izzy, over the years that followed, made many disciples. Many people came to faith. Many people grew in their faith. And today, to this day, Bill and Izzy continue to make disciples. So I had the joy of having, well, I've not just made a disciple, I've made a disciple who's now making disciples. And I want to encourage you to go for that. Just on a, on a practical note, how do you do that? Let me just give you a very simple methodology that I use. Four letters, MAWL, M-A-W-L. Model, assist, watch, leave. You can do this with people in your small group. You can do this with people 
in your leadership, or you could do this with people in your team. Model, assist, watch, leave. So let's take an example. If I'm doing a water baptism, I could model to my disciples how to do baptism. I could, they could watch me do it. I, I have some in the water. I, I say, well, let's share your testimony. And then I, I say, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you in Jesus' name. And we, we baptize them and we all applaud. And, and we, we, I, I've modeled to my disciples how to do it. Next time we have a baptism, three weeks later, um, I could get one of my disciples to come in the water with me. In fact, it might be the person who I baptized last time is now in the water with me and they're helping me baptize this other person. So they're standing with me and they're assisting me. And, and what we're doing in that moment is, I, I might say to them, okay, could you do the te- you, you interview the person, do their testimony? Can you pray for them before we baptize them? And then I'll do the rest. So they're now assisting me in the water. Now the next time, a couple of weeks later, we've got more baptisms because the church is growing. Next time, instead of them assisting me, they're doing it. And I'm out of the water. I'm standing on the edge watching. So model assist, watch. I'm now watching. And they're in the water. And I've asked them, can you now lead the entire baptism? So they've watched me do it. They assisted me doing it. Now I'm watching them do it. And they're saying, hey, welcome to today's baptism. They, do, they lead people in the testimony. They pray for them. They baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They do the whole thing. And then a few weeks later, I say to them, we need to baptize more people. I'm not even going to be there. Can you do it? I leave. It's the journey out. And this is what Jesus did with his disciples over three years. And then he left. He modeled. He allowed them to assist. He watched and he gave them feedback. And then he left. And you can do the same in your team or your small group or your church. Let's make disciples. And then point number seven. And I guess this is pointing out the obvious. What was it that satisfied Jesus? What was it that Jesus felt? Wow, I feel well nourished. Number seven, don't just uh, lead believers, reach out to the lost. And this is kind of an obvious point, but it's so obvious we might miss it. Jesus found satisfaction not just in reaching a believer, but in reaching someone who was lost and brought them to faith. And you're going to find satisfaction in doing that as well. We have a a description that I found helpful to describe what a balanced Christian life looks like. It's like a triangle. Up, in, and out. Up, in, out. In fact, get get your finger and do that with me. Up, in, out. And that's what the balanced Christian life looks like. Jesus was up, in, out. Jesus was up. He was all about the Father. Up. His life was about the Father. In, out. He was all about the disciples. He loved the church. He loved the disciples. Out, Jesus was all about the sinners. Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was up, in, and out. All three. Some believers, some Christians, are just about up and in. They're all about the Father, and they're all about the disciples. They love church, and they love God, but they have no connection with lost people. That's not like Jesus, because Jesus was up, in, and out. Other people are just about... In and out. (laughs) They love being with people, Christian people and non-Christian people. But they don't have much of a relationship with God. They don't have much up. Well, that's not like Jesus because Jesus was all about the Father. And so let's be up, in and out. That's balanced Christianity. Notice that Jesus, how do you do that? How do you reach a lost person? Well, take Jesus' example. He didn't feel the pressure to tell her everything. (laughs) Notice he didn't give her the Romans roads. You know, you're a sinner and sin leads to death. He didn't give her the Romans road. Now, sometimes you can, but in this occasion, he didn't. He didn't tell her about, I'm going to die on the cross for your sins and rise again the third day. He didn't tell her that. He didn't tell her about heaven or hell or explain to her the Trinity. He just sowed a seed. And it was a great first step for her. And she was impacted. Just sow a seed. Leaders, don't just connect with believers. Reach the lost because there's something so deeply satisfying about that. And I know not all of you are evangelists, but all of us are called to evangelize and it models something for the flock as well. I love how after Jesus' death and resurrection, Pentecost happens, revival spread. And in Acts chapter 8, we see Philip. It says Philip went down to the city, to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed uh, and they all paid close attention to what he said and with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
I, I, I kind of believe that what that seed Jesus sowed, and he didn't give them maybe the whole picture, but Philip came and he told them not about a cross that was to come, but a cross that has happened and a resurrection. So the, there was more details filled in. And I see this revival among the Samaritans. I happen to believe that one of those church leaders would have been that woman that Jesus met. I think you're going to meet her when you get to heaven. But the point is this, don't just be in a Christian bubble, reach out to the lost. In conclusion, leaders, go global leaders. I want us to be healthy leaders. And that comes from being well nourished. Remember, you need food and exercise. You can't just take in good stuff, you've also got to give out good stuff. The right kind of work, not just busy, busy, busy work, but within the busyness, we're doing the work of God. And the work of God is actually so closely linked to making disciples. I want you to be healthy and well-fed leaders. I don't want you to be on fast food, the fast food of shallow leadership and just busyness without fruitfulness. I want you to be nourished and satisfied from being disciples who make disciples. God bless you.